I'm delighted to say, delighted, that the Minister is with us, and uh, to just say a few words about uh, David Willits, uh, the uh, Sire Minister for Universities and Science at uh, Biz. Uh, David, I think, has done a superb job for universities, for research, and not just the standard traditional hard sciences research, but including social science in his time as Minister. He has, of course, a long track record in other roles in government and in opposition, and I think perhaps that's all I need to say, except, of course, that um, he is the author of a book, The Pinch, which all of us have read, and he will now uh, ask you questions about that. He's made clear that he's going to talk for a short period, and then he would welcome questions thereafter from the audience. So may I introduce the Minister, Right Honourable David Willits. Uh, well, uh, thank you very much indeed, David. It's great to be here. Congratulations to Sharon for, I'm sure, brilliant ad-libbing, because uh, I'm sorry that I was uh, running late. And Sharon may already have shared with you some of the information about QSTAR. But let me, let me just very briefly set the scene. And to my mind, the, the, the scene is partly set by a lecture that is now uh, 55 years old, C.P. C. C. P. Snow on the two cultures. Um, and interest, uh, and the two cultures, you can think of them as particle physics versus Dickens, but at the heart of it is numeracy and the and confidence in the analysis and use of the symbols of modern maths and analysis. Incidentally, he rightly, uh, I was rereading it the other day, that's why it's in my mind, he rightly, when he tries to explain the problem of the two cultures, although he attributes it partly to underlying sort of trends in the Western world, specifically says it's worse in England because of educational specialization at the age of 16. Uh, and he is right. In many ways, we're all trying to deal with the consequences of people who may have stopped studying maths at the age of 16. And of course, we in the coalition are trying to do something about that by... Um, as a minimum, encouraging them to do some kind of maths AS after that, because maths is so fundamental to rigorous analysis in almost every area. And I was thinking of what kind of comes across my desk as a lay person in government, and the amount of analysis of social policy, social science challenges, which just depends on mathematical analysis. And so I've done, an, I did an ad hoc analysis of my own weekend box, which included an excellent piece of work put online by The Lancet a couple of weeks ago, uh, Nursing, Staffing and Education and Hospital Mortality in Nine European Countries, a retrospective observational study. It doesn't have sophisticated maths, thank heavens, but it's basically trying to analyse the question if you have more nurses with degrees, is that a good thing or a bad thing? And it's got some very interesting evidence of lower mortality rates in hospitals where a higher percentage of the nurses have got a graduate qualification. So using a mixture of evidence and fairly standard mathematical techniques to answer a very hot uh, issue. Um, girls going into STEM, trying to track the route of girls into STEM and trying to work out <coughs> what their chances are of staying on and do STEM subjects at different stages of the educational process, where you just need to be able to analyse the data. And indeed, in this very building and other events at the Royal Society, we have talked about the rise of data and the significance of big data. It's one of the great, one of the great emerging trends. It's transforming the physical sciences as they deal with very large data sets. But it also presents enormous opportunities to the social sciences and more widely beyond that. We are generating unbelievable amounts of data now. And so the ability to analyse that data and use it for whatever purpose matters more than ever. So the basic maths that you need in order to um, analyse data is a widespread requirement. And we in government use it. Um, when we have, uh, if we try, as we try to strengthen our role in the in, uh, uh, empirical analysis of uh, policy, things like the What Works networks, 
the what works networks basically mean that you've got to have data and the ability to analyze that data uh, in order to work out what works in social policy. The birth cohort studies, where we of course invested in the 2012 birth cohort study, but we're also investing in trying to extract more information from the data sets that have been collected going right back to 1946 using better statistical techniques than ever before. So you don't need me to tell you about the importance of maths and the capacity to handle data. But in social policy in particular, there is a real challenge here because lots of people get interested in social science for completely ad admirable reasons. They, they are exercised about poverty. They want to live in a fairer society. But they may have given up maths at the age of 16. It's almost sometimes a moral or, or emotional interest, a commitment that gets them into social science. But then uh, they, have, they don't have the tools to do the job in the way in which in the modern world it has to be done. And that's where initiatives like this one come in. And uh, the statistics are, as you know, shocking. We've got essentially uh, the two that stand out to my mind is that only... 16% of undergraduates studying subjects other than maths have an A-level in maths. So if you're, not, if you're outside the, the central group, it's, you're very unlikely to have an A-level in maths. And we did, there was one estimate that there were about 330,000 students who were thought, judging from the courses they were doing, would really benefit from having A-level maths but only 125,000 actually had A-level maths. So there is a real challenge. Now, it's, it's a challenge that goes beyond social science and social policy, and I'm a great admirer as well of the Sigma initiative, which tries to make remedial maths or access to maths available in across our universities for people who suddenly find that they need it. You may be doing English literature and suddenly find that some... Uh, there's been some sophisticated analysis of the use of different words in a text that deploys statistical techniques that you can't understand. Uh, you may be um, doing uh, politics and set to read some papers on anal analysing the results of an American presidential election with regression analysis. And the normal reactions, as we know, are either skim through all the stuff with the data and the analysis and just go straight to the conclusion, and I remember, I always remember, say I remember when I started, I started my career as a Treasury official. I remember as a junior Treasury official, my, uh, my uh, boss, my seniors in the Treasury hierarchy, always used to write the arguments for things, and then they'd send them down to me with gaps where all the facts and figures were to be, <laughs> and ask me to insert the facts and figures to support the argument, which I'm sure it's not how they do economic policy in Treasury now, but uh, <laughs> far from it. But the... But that sense that you either panic or you skim over it or you ignore that bit because it's all too complicated. And it's, it's very bad if we all get into that habit. And Sigma is an attempt to tackle that uh, more widely. QSTEP is an excellent initiative which we strongly support tackling it specifically in the social sciences. Um, now, uh, I don't know what uh, was being said, but let me just... Uh, confirm the kind of scale of what we're talking about. It's £19.5 million pound funding um, f with funding from the Nuffield Foundation and we're very grateful to Nuffield for taking the lead on this and Sharon has personally backed it very strongly but also with funding from the ESRC and HEFKE um, and it is an excellent initiative which we strongly support. Um, the, there was a competition for uh, the new funded centres and out of the, I think, 55 staff that were going to be taken in on, 33 of these posts have already been recruited and they're being filled with um, high, uh, highly qualified quantitative social scientists who will be able to really transform undergraduate teaching in social sciences and who've also got good research records. Interestingly, one third of the new post holders are not currently teaching in the UK and many of the others are newly qualified. So this looks like we're bringing in genuinely new capacity in the teaching of quantitative techniques for social scientists. And the, uh, there is, the expectation is a further 
15 posts to be filled by the end of this academic year with the remainder to be recruited next year. So this absolutely gets to the heart of the challenge of ensuring that when people are studying a social science at university, part of what a university offers should be people who are skilled in teaching them in the quantitative techniques that they need to do social sciences. And uh, that seems to me admirable and what university students will increasingly expect. Of course, the challenge is to go beyond, further beyond this initiative. As this initiative uh, ramps up, there will be yet more, more to do. And I'm very pleased that the Nuffield Foundation are also uh, envisaging more work with the development of a network of Q-STEP affiliates. And that the aim is to reach beyond the funded Q-STEP centres uh, and uh, to go beyond that with a wider range of departments. So I think it's a great initiative and we in government will be heavy users of the graduates that emerge from these programmes because we need quantitative social science to input into our policy making but the need goes way beyond that um, and I'm very much congratulate the people who are already participating in the programme and dream of the day when it is just automatically assumed that as part of doing a social science degree at a British university, you get trained in the quantitative techniques necessary to do the job, including being taught by people who have themselves been trained in how they need to teach maths, including, sadly, to people who may have think that they turned their back on it at the age of 16. So this is a great initiative. I strongly support it and very happy to answer any questions or comments you may have. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you very much, uh, David. Um, questions, ladies and gentlemen? There's a gentleman there, and I can see, and the microphone is about to come. Could you please give your affiliation and, and so on? Tony Gardner, London Mathematical Society, Birmingham. Uh, Q-Step and Sigma are both, in some sense, remedial. And remedial work is sometimes important. Your old school has just changed to IB so that everybody has to do <coughs> mathematics. Would you like to see social science departments sending a message to schools by requiring applicants or rewarding applicants who have done AS level, say, mathematics before they come with a slightly reduced offer? Shall we take multiple questions, or are you... You mean you think I need time to work out the answer to that <laughs> <laughs> You might say yes. that. <laughs> uh, yeah, why don't you take a couple more, yes. <laughs> <laughs> a couple down the front here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Hitan Shah, uh, Director of the Royal Statistical Society, and it sort of builds on the previous question, which is to say, uh, you know, we congratulate your department in sort of the way that it's thinking about these issues and the, the work you've been doing around open data and uh, other related fields as well it does take a sort of broadly statistical view. But uh, the, the Department for Education is thinking slightly more narrowly in the way that it's approaching some of these questions. And how do you see the relationship between the two departments? Uh, not least that the, the Education Minister was quite keen on taking over some of the bits of your department at the weekend uh, we saw. <laughs> I look forward to your right. response yeah. to that. <laughs> <laughs> and another one here. Yeah. Bernard Casey from Sweden. Is that, is that yeah. Bernard Casey, University of Warwick. Um, actually, in order to study PPE, which I believe you did as well, I had to take um, an examination in Latin to get in that my maths was f of, of the age of 15. However, what I want to ask you about is um, research methods, master's courses, um, which are taught in universities, and which appear, in my experience, often to be taught by putting people into laboratories with uh, computers and teaching them how to do statistics on the basis of pressing buttons on SPSS programs. And is this something which you would like to comment upon? Yeah. Um, right. 
On the, I mean, there is a, there are some facts. First of all, uni, on the first question, universities have to set their own, determine their own admissions procedures, and I would not wish to um, uh, tell universities how to choose who, who to admit and on what basis. Uh, there will be, we have to, it's easy, of course there are problems earlier in the system, but in my experience, people in education spend too much time waiting for the people at the previous stage to solve a problem for them. Each of us have to get put our shoulders to the wheel with the group that we're responsible for. And I think these type of initiatives make a lot of sense for that reason. And we are some way off your being able to assume that everybody who comes up to do a social science course will have an A-level in maths. In terms of where the Department for Education are, I mean, I discuss this a lot with Michael Gove, and particularly actually Liz Truss. And Liz is... Um, an enthusiastic advocate of maths as the kind of the, the universal sort of skill, the universal analytical requirement. And what she and I absolutely agree on is the importance of trying to make it possible for students post-16 to keep up with their maths. And as you know, they are they're very keen to encouraging a kind of AS maths, at least as a minimum, even if you're doing other courses. Um, in research, and on the final point, on research method, I mean, and, I, and as you say, I did PP. Looking back, I'm shocked at how little effort was made in the Oxford PPE course to provide us with training in mathematical techniques for economics. And I hope it's got better since uh, when I did it ages ago in the 70s, late 70s. But the... This is where, as I say, universities have to deal with people as they are. And I always argue one of the part of the case for university, part of the value of going to university, is all the extras, which often aren't captured explicitly when people think they're going to, going to university to study history or social science or whatever. But the university that says, and by the way, you can do a Mandarin course if you like, and we've got this link to a Chinese university that you might be able to go and study within the summer, all those things are a massive enhancement of the university experience. And access to kind of help with the maths, even as someone said quite rightly, remedial maths, uh, should be seen as part of what makes going to university worthwhile and different from a non-university experience. And for research methods, I don't know exactly what's happening on research methods, but certainly <coughs> research methods should include um, data from... Uh, social sciences. I mean, part of the we all buy the argument that part of the reasons for the way in which the financial system failed to function properly was that they were treating sometimes social science data as if it was the same like data from a Large Hadron Collider. And it isn't the same as the data from the Large Hadron Collider. And people who treat social science data as if it's the same as that and just apply those techniques that have been developed in incredibly sophisticated form for dealing with sort of data sets from the physical sciences are, are really uh, making almost a kind of category mistake. And um, so these quantitative techniques have to take account of the fact that some of the data sets will be fundamentally different. More questions? Oh, we've got a forest of them now. There's a gentleman across there and a gent across there as well, I think. Um, Anna Vignell's University of Cambridge. Um, I wanted to ask the Minister his views on the role of employers and learned societies. I'm very struck that although we uh, find it incredibly difficult to encourage students to engage with quantitative methods in some social science subjects, psychology has made great strides, largely, I think, by uh, the British so uh, Psychological Society insisting on a minimum level of uh, quantitative training. And I do wonder whether that's a, a sort of model that we might think about in, in other areas. Let's pick another two. Hi. There's one there, and there's another one off across there. Hi, uh, I'm, I'm Julian Nichols from Great Bar School. I'm a psychology and sociology teacher. I'm just interested in the coherence uh, between the, the two departments of your department, obviously, the Department for Education, and, and really to find out kind of what steps are being taken to make sure that the demands that are there and universities kind of expect of A-level students and people going into university, what steps are being, uh, are being taken to make sure that um, 
that, that those students are well qualified to take on those courses because I know as a psychology teacher there are you know the the current a level course you know demands a kind of an expectation of a statistical understanding but there are other kind of social sciences courses de geography courses and and kind of what is happening to make sure that we are preparing students to meet the needs that they'll be expected to fulfill at university thank you right. uh, and last one in this group uh, Penny Young, Chief Exec of NatSEM Social Research. How can we encourage kids from households and families who are less well off to get enthusiastic about maths at an early a earlier age, given it's such a passport to social mobility? Mm. Right. Um, first of all, I very much agree with Anna Vignol's point. And um, there are, there's another great example of this role of a learning society, which is the Society of Biologists of our kite-marking courses in life sciences which include the level of kind of wet lab skills you would need then to be able to be set to work in a GSK lab. And because one of the criticisms in the industry is people who are getting, emerging, having done a biological science degree, but who had done the textbooks but hadn't got the, the practical training that went alongside it. Uh, and we, we support that kite marking initiative. So a kind of society of maths kite marking, this is a course that includes, that has got people who are professionally qualified to teach you maths to help you do this subject better is a very good idea and exactly the kind of way we could advance. So that's a very helpful suggestion. On the uh, demands on A-level students, uh, of course universities are involved through this consultation on A-levels. And I always say to universities, um, you know, the issue isn't the, uh, the structure of Whitehall. The issue is how... A-levels historically were shaped by universities. They were, their origins have always been as a route to get into university. Currently, universities are being consulted on the design of A-levels, starting with maths as one of the early ones. So I don't know offhand the names of the people engaged in that exercise. It's being overall masterminded by Nigel Thrift at Warwick University. But write to him asking that to engage with his team saying to them, this is what in these university courses is the kind of maths we're looking for. It is currently, therefore, that something that HE is very heavily engaged with. And on the, on the less well off, um, and you're right, there is evidence, isn't there, that I think maths, everything, other things being equal, having some maths at any level of, quali at any level of education boosts your earnings by about 10% compared with people with equivalent standards without maths. I have to say that often it is quite uh, a utilitarian. This is what you can do if you've got the maths. And it goes back to my answer to the previous question. Part of how the new curriculum is trying to be constructed, certainly at GCSE level for maths, is how you can use maths in the day-to-day -day business of shopping, working out your living costs, working out what a rate of interest means. And there is an attempt to bring those kind of practical applications of maths into the curriculum. David probably knows more about it than I do, but I think it's heading that way. Thanks very much indeed. Other questions? Young lady here in blue. <laughs> Thank you very much, David. <laughs> um, Denise Leavesley from King's College London. Rather than a question, I, I wanted to make a comment on one of the first points made. Um, one of the things that we've done recently at King's is we've looked at the performance in social science um, of students who've done the IB and compared them to the performance of students who've done A-levels. And we found that students who did IB did considerably better in our undergraduate social science degrees. And I think that's partly maths, it's partly the combination of subjects, yeah. I think it's also the theory of knowledge course, which I think is really critical. So we've lowered um, our requirements in terms of uh, recruitment for IB students, and we're working with schools to try to encourage and support them in terms of the IB. Mm. Um, so I suppose there is a question, and that is, what more could we be doing? How should we be linking across the school-university yeah. divide yeah. to try to get these messages across and to help schools uh, achieve better mathematics training. Yeah. 
Just one at the back there, yes, and another one there. I'm Dougal Goodman from the Foundation for Science and Technology, but I'm also a parent. I think I should just put the point of view from a parent. My daughter was a very bright student. I, she wanted to do biology, and I'm sure this applies to social sciences. She wanted to go to Oxford. I said to her, you must do maths A-level because it's very important. Biology is becoming more and more quantitative. So maths is essential for your time at Oxford. She said to me, I might not get an A in maths, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to do maths because I might not get into Oxford. Mm -hmm. And that was true. That she had to get three A's to get into Oxford, and if she'd taken maths, she might not have got the A. Mm -hmm. So parents have a role to play in this, but universities also have a role to play in deciding what the admission standards should be. Yes, um, Jeff Evans, Middlesex University. I was interested that you mentioned the problematical application of models from physics um, in the analysis of financial markets. And I wondered if you have any reservations about, <coughs> excuse me, the way that um, big data is being presented as a, and, and its methods of analysis is being presented as a panacea for so many problems these days. I mean, I'm concerned about the fact that there isn't a very clear theory of knowledge behind a lot of the work, the sort of a-theoretical um, data mining um, approaches where, uh, where the results can't be easily inspected by a human who presumably has been trained in the way that we all hope that QSTEP will train people. Right. Good, and that, that might be a very good note on which to end, actually, because that is a very fair point at the end. Look, so my, to my uh, final set of comments, um, I think on the, on the IB, uh, there is a, again, first of all, universities can run their admission processes the way that they wish. Isn't the guy, is it still Jeff Haywood who was sitting in an office somewhere in Oxford determining the rates of the exchange rates between just about every conceivable academic qualification? And there is a debate ultimately for him and then UCAS about how points are allocated mm -hmm. and the calculation of the value of the IB. And if the evidence is indeed as you suggested, then that should feed through into the way in which UCAS collects and uses tariff points. Now, university is not completely driven by tariff points, um, but that would be, that, that's something that, if you've got that kind of evidence, I think UCAS and Jeff, Jeff Haywood should be aware of. Um, yeah, and I thought Dougal's point, I may not get an A, and that is, a, I have no comment, other than, other than it rings true, I realise absolutely the issue. Um, and again, universities have some discretion about the value that they attach. And we've already got the Russell Group, the very useful exercise in the Russell Group, in signaling what they call the facilitating A-levels, so that they are identifying the A-levels that have the greatest potential to help you and help secure you a place on the, some of the most popular courses. Of course, that's not just maths, but certainly uh, maths and further maths appears in their short list of facilitating subjects, which is a kind of way of signaling we will attach more value to A-levels than these and than some other subjects. Yeah, and the final point is one, absolutely, which is a very good note on, on which to conclude, that the, uh, the, the world... Wasn't it Popper who used to tease his class at the LSE by when they all filed in, saying, first of all, form your hypothesis? I mean, unless you've got some sense of a question or debate, you don't know what to do when you've got just a pile of data. And trying to make sense of it involves a set of prior assumptions and uh, the shaping of questions that has often preceded the data. But kind of our... I think at the moment... Uh, our problem is not that Britain is over-endowed with large numbers of social scientists who are so up to speed in the latest statistical techniques that they have become preoccupied with those techniques to the exclusion of, for example, historical understanding or social awareness. Our issue is that we've got lots of people who care about this and we have read lovely essays about the history of social policy in Britain or whatever and have got interested in it, but uh, are... Um, underweight on the quantitative side. So um, kind of your problem would be, a, at the moment, would be a nice problem to have, I think. And maybe uh, 
I, I, and I can envisage in the future, it'd be great to have an interesting discussion about the need for some kind of theory of knowledge behind people using these statistical techniques. And as I said, there have been some disciplines where that has been the problem. I think um, at the moment, the challenge in social sciences is to strengthen those techniques, which is why I'm such a strong supporter of the excellent QSTEP initiative. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Very much.